just remain standing, if you will, and take your Bibles. And if you will turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, we're going to look this morning at the first seven verses. Verse 1 through 7 today, Mark chapter 16. The title of the message is Resurrection, A New Beginning. Resurrection, A New Beginning. And we've heard about it here today. Thank you, choir and praise team and all that have led us in worship musically where we've been able to prepare our hearts already for the reading of God's Word. I'll give our choir a little bit of time just to get to their place so they can get their scripture ready as well so we can read here today Mark chapter 16 beginning in verse 1 follow along with me as we read let me get my set of eyes on so I can read so let's read verse 1 it says this now when the Sabbath was passed Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they sat and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But, do not be alarmed. You seek Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter... That he's going before you into Galilee, there you will see him as he said to you. Father, thank you for the reading of your word this morning and thank you for already what we've been able to be reminded of, be encouraged by. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that has led us through the music and the songs and the words already this morning. We want to continue to worship. We want to continue to praise you and honor you and to thank you for this day that we celebrate as celebration, Easter, resurrection, your life's not dead Sunday. And we pray, Father, that you will help us this morning to see and hear the very things that you desire us to learn and to be challenged from by the resurrection, by your life here today. I pray that you'll hide me behind the cross that I stand behind right now and that you will let others, only others, see you and hear you and may you just speak to me the words that you would have me to speak, that they would come forth with power, excitement, enthusiasm. And Lord, that I would stand here today not worried about what someone may say about the delivery today, whether it's good or bad or indifferent, but Lord, that I would stand here today and preach the word of God the way you desire and not worry about anything but be pleasing and honoring to you. I pray that That's my desire. I pray that's what will come forth in my life here today is we're here to hear a word from you and we have a word from you and Lord, we want to hear a word from you and we pray knowing when we hear a word from you that you will will change us, you will move us, you will motivate us, you will forgive us, you will heal us, you will lead us to becoming a people, Lord, that lives every day as we know that you're alive and well. Thank you for what you're going to do here this morning. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated this morning. Mark chapter 16 is just one of the stories we find out in the scripture about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is a resurrection that even today, every day, brings about new beginnings for each and every one of us. As we gather this morning on this day and celebrate, we're celebrating that each and every one of us can have a new start, a new beginning, a new day this morning as we worship Him together in this sanctuary. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ sets Christianity apart from all others. There's not a one, not any other denomination or any other religion in the world that comes close to being able to experience you and I experience what we experience through the resurrection the resurrection as we know is very unique to the Christian faith 
Other religious leaders throughout time have died, but only one has conquered the grave. And that's the one that we're here to worship and lift up and remind ourselves, be reminded that Jesus is alive. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he tells us what the gospel of Jesus really is. We find it throughout the scripture, but there's no greater place than 1 Corinthians 15 where he depicts to us, explains to us, shares with us what the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says this. He says that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross for all sinners according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures, he gave his life. He also said that Jesus Christ, not only did he die on the cross according to the scriptures, but it says in the scripture that Jesus was buried. That he was buried. He died, so then he was buried. And then the following, we're here to talk about and praise the Lord today. It says that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, not according to speculation, but according to the scriptures. According to the scripture. So that is the gospel. The gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's the gospel. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us different as far as believers having Christ in us. Because the only way to experience and receive the gospel is believing in the death and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the gospel lives in us if that's the case. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, it says this. He says, who was delivered up because of our offenses. He was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. He was raised for our justification. So today we gather on this Sunday For a very special day. A very special day. Resurrection day. The day that our Lord is alive. Today, this morning, God has given me some words I believe straight from Him. And I will tell you that the words that He's placed on my heart came a little later in the week than normal. And I was beginning to wonder about that. But come this past Friday, around 2 o'clock, He had given me the word to be able to share with you here this morning. So today, I want to explain to you, not from the internet, not from an author who has a great perspective on this thing called the resurrection, but I want to explain to you from the holy word of God what Easter is all about. What Easter is all about and what it means to each and every one of us in this room. So today, the first thing I want you to see with me The first thing from the Word of God is this. Easter is about finding hope. Easter is about finding hope this morning. Mark 16, 1, the first part of the verse says this. Now, when the Sabbath was passed. That's a very significant few words there to begin this chapter. As he says, now when the Sabbath was passed. Now, as we think about the Sabbath being passed, let's remember there was a day between Good Friday and the Resurrection Day. There was a day, a very significant, very important day, between the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know it as a day that was a very sad day. We also know that in Scripture, the Bible, the Bible doesn't give us many intimate details about what took place on this day called Saturday. So with not having a lot of details, we put together with what took place on, on, on Crucifixion Day, Good Friday, and what we know took place on Resurrection Sunday, we're able to put our minds and to begin to imagine what that day must have been like. On Friday, Jesus was crucified. He was crucified. He was buried in a tomb. And the Bible specifically tells us he was buried in a tomb that was owned by a man of Joseph of Arimathea. And then Saturday, the scripture tells us, as we just read, that the Sabbath passed. People, don't miss this, but people had lost all hope. They had lost all hope. Their healer was in the grave. 
Their Savior was in the grave. And their healer in the grave, their Savior in the grave, and the devil is there telling them all hope and all dreams that you had were all in vain. I've tried to tell you that over and over and over and over again, that you were living in vain. What were you believing? Why were you believing this? And the devil continues to echo and shout that to the people during this day between the, the, the death on the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a sad day. It was a gloomy day. It was a hopeless day. And as I thought about that, even on Friday, as God gave me those thoughts and knowing, trying to, trying to imagine in my mind what kind of day it must have been, I begin to think in my own life, maybe, maybe that's the same kind of experience that some of you on this Easter Sunday morning in your finest clothes and the excitement to be here this morning in this worship center to praise the Lord, maybe you come and deep down inside at your life, at your heart, you're experiencing today, you're experiencing lack of hope, you're having gloom that's overtaken your life, your field, your heart is depressed and discouraged because of events that have taken place or even events that are taking place right now in your life. Maybe you're here and you have had a loss of a job or, or maybe even today that your marriage is coming apart at the seams. Or maybe even this morning your son or your daughter is keeping you up at night because you see you watch them throwing their life away. Or maybe you've been to the doctor's office and you've heard that doctor say those words that you never, ever want to hear. You don't want anybody to hear those words. We've done all that we know to do. Your dreams have been shattered. Your goals, that they haven't been realized. So even this morning in this place, you sit here with the voice of the enemy. Even in this room, you sit here with the voice of the enemy telling you, there's no hope for you. You have no future. There's no future for you. There's no life in the future for you. There's nothing waiting for you. There's nothing to look forward to. The enemy is at work and he's at work even in the lives of many of our hearts in this place today with our intent to come and celebrate. I want to remind you that Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. A stone seals the entryway. The tomb is being guarded by soldiers. And I'm just telling you, it looks as there, if, as there is no hope. It looks that there is no hope, nothing to look forward to. But I want you to know this morning, and I have the best job in the world, especially on Easter Sunday morning. The best job in the whole wide world because I get to stand here and tell you there is hope for all of us. I have good news for you because Jesus Christ is alive. We've been singing about it. We've been singing about it. We've been sharing with one another. Happy Resurrection Day. Happy Easter. We're saying that He's alive and we're so blessed knowing He's alive. My life is never the same because He's alive. But I get to stand and tell you that Jesus Christ is alive. And listen to this. There's a resurrection in your future there's a resurrection in your future yes he has risen he's alive today but because he has there's a resurrection for the believer in the future oh think about these ladies for a moment those ladies didn't realize on Saturday what was going to happen on Sunday they didn't realize what was going to take place when they left the house to go mourn over the dead, over the body of Jesus. They didn't realize at the moment when they would arrive at the tomb that they were going to find out that you cannot keep the healer down, that you cannot keep the Savior down, that the grave could not hold him. So what they experienced is the very thing that we experience today, and that is hope was reborn in an empty tomb. It was reborn. Hope became alive like never before because of the empty tomb. And the Bible says this. He says they came early in the morning. Notice verse 2. It says very early in the morning. On the first day of the week they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. 
Can I just say today that that's when you ought to come to Christ? That, that's, that's what I want to say to you here today because that is the words of Scripture this morning. I have parents often that will come to me and they will say, Pastor, can my little girl or can my little boy, can they understand enough as a child to trust Christ as their Savior? And you know my response to that, parents and grandparents should have a priority to pray every single day for the salvation of their children, the salvation of their grandchildren early in life so that they would accept Christ. See, they need to hear the gospel and need to respond to it when their hearts are tender. Because if we don't accept Christ as a young person, a child, when we're growing up, the life that we live in, our hearts become hardened in the world we live in. That's why it's so important. That's why our children's ministry and helping you in any way we can to teach your children and to lead them to a place of saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why that's the most important thing we do here in this church because when someone gets older, their heart becomes hardened and it's hard for them not that they can't accept Christ in their life, but it comes, becomes even more difficult for them. I think about as children. I think about my parents whenever I was a child. They took me to the doctor's office and I received my immunizations. My immunizations were given to me so I could avoid disease and sickness in the future. That's the reason that they took me because it would help me to be able to overcome whatever would come to my body that would try to defeat me and destroy me. Why don't we give a gospel immunization to our children why do we not do that that would lead them to a place that would prevent against sin and would present against the, the power of Satan in their heart and their lives to get a hold of them and lead them and discourage them the Bible says they came early in the morning now notice what they said to one another oh notice what they said verse 3 and they said among themselves who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us. How can these ladies roll away a stone that weighs 3,000 pounds? They perhaps didn't know that it weighed 3,000 pounds, but they knew that it weighed more than, than what they could handle, what they could move out of the way. So they had these worries as they travel to the tomb. As they're heading on this Sunday morning after a, such a drastic, difficult day on Friday watching the Savior die and then seeing Him be buried, knowing that their hopes have been shattered, their dreams have dissolved and taken away, and now they're heading to the tomb and they're heading there wondering, how they're going to get in to anoint and mourn over the body of Jesus Christ. They had worries they brought to the tomb. I believe today that many of you have made your way to West Acres today on this Easter Sunday, and you've got a lot of worries. I don't know what they are. But I know he did what he did then so that he would, could remind us here this morning that our worries are not worth carrying alone. That he came to take those from us. I want to give you something that I believe will help you today if you've brought your worries into this room. Something that I believe will be an encouragement to you here today. Look in verse 4. It says, but when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away for it was very large. For it was very large. I was reading just a few days ago in a commentary that I shared with Kay, a, a, a man by the name of William McDonald. William McDonald. And he said this. This is a quote from William McDonald. And I thought, how appropriate for right here in this message this morning. He said this, and I quote, How often it happens when we are intent on honoring the Savior that difficulties are removed before we even ever get there. Even before we get there. Even before we get to those troubles. When our intent is on honoring the Savior. See their intent was honoring the Savior. They were going to the tomb to honor the Savior. 
And when they got there, because of their honoring spirit and desire, the tomb had already been removed. We overcome worry by several things. Three main things. And I just throw them out to you. The first one is this. The way we overcome worry is through the promises of God. Through the promises of God. That God has given promise after promise after promise. And he says, if you will take my promises and believe those promises, you will be able to move on without worry. The second thing is this. is for you to remember promises, but for you to pray. For you to pray. Pray, Lord, I remember your promises. Lord, I believe that you're a promise-keeping God. Lord, I believe you'll do what you say you'll do. So when you remember the promises and you get on your knees and you faithfully, sincerely pray, then the third thing is, is we praise His name. We praise you, Lord, because you've heard my prayer. We praise you, Lord, because you've been fulfilling every day promises that you've promised to fulfill in my life. And those you have not fulfilled, I know you will because you have those in the past in my life. Amen. And you know what happens? You know what happens whenever we remember the promise? And you know what happens whenever we pray and cry out to God? You know what happens when we remember the promise and pray and we praise the Lord? Here's what happens. Peace comes over your life. And it's not just a peace. It's a peace that Paul talks about. It's a peace that surpasses our even own understanding. We can't make sense out of it. Because we're honoring the Lord and he removes the obstacles before we even ever get to them. Romans 4.21 says this, And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he will also be able to perform. What he's promised, he will perform. I got to thinking even this past week with preparing this message and the Lord brought to my mind the children of Israel. He brought to my mind the children of Israel. And I thought about this. You know, the children of Israel, they didn't shout after the walls came down at Jericho. Now, now think about that just for a moment. The children of Israel, they did not shout after the walls had fallen down on the day of Jericho, at the, at down at Jericho. They shouted before the walls came down at Jericho. They were shouting before. They shouted like they were down even when they weren't down before they fell down and they fell down because they were willing to step out in faith and believe God's promises would come to pass within their lives. That's the reason the wall fa fell is because they shouted in belief that God was going to do what God said He was going to do. Easter this morning, church, is about finding hope. And there are many in here you may not know what you're searching for. But for many here today, you're searching for hope. You may not spell it H-O-P-E. You may spell it something else that you're looking for. But hope is what you're looking for. And it's found in the resurrection. Number two this morning. Easter is not only about finding hope. But Easter is about celebrating hope life. It's about celebrating life. Look at what these ladies found when they got to the tomb of Jesus in verse 5. And entering the tomb. Can you just imagine? I know that's hard. But can you imagine what they must have been experiencing? And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Can I just tell you the first thing that came to my mind whenever I pictured this in my heart? The tomb had been turned into a house of worship. It had been turned into a house of worship. And church, that's what Easter is all about. Easter is about celebrating life. Church services should not be like a funeral service. They should not look like a funeral service really in any way, form, or fashion. A worship service celebrating life means that we have life. We're celebrating because he's alive. We have life. An angel was sitting there with words of great hope. Don't miss this again. The tomb of Jesus had been turned into a worship center. And they were worshiping the name of the Lord. Look in verse 6. But he said to them, 
Do not be afraid. He's saying that to somebody today. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See, come in and check out the place where they laid him. This is wonderful news. And he says, this wonderful news, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with other people. Look in verse 7. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you in Galilee and there you will see him as he said to you. He says, go. Go to the disciples. Go and tell them. And they're going and they're telling them that Jesus will see them in Galilee. I don't have to ask you this. I believe you believe it. But I want you to know I believe in the resurrection. I believe for so many reasons I could spend the rest of the time in the message, which I can't do that, but to spend the rest of the time in the message why I believe in the resurrection. But can I tell you one, one or two reasons that I believe in the resurrection? One is this. Years ago, Kay and I got to go to Israel. We got to go to Israel, we went to the garden tomb. And just as that angel said that he's not there, this is where they laid him, but he's gone, he's risen, we walked in there. And I'm just telling you, that's the truth. He wasn't there. He's alive. He's alive more than ever within my heart and within my life. So I believe in the resurrection because that tomb is empty. But I also believe in the resurrection because Jesus knocked one day at the door of my heart. And Jesus Christ, who walked out of the tomb, whenever I opened my heart, he walked into my heart. He made my heart his home. And he lives there. He didn't make my heart his home because he knew one day I was going to be a person be able to have the privilege to stand and talk about the word of God from people for people to hear and listen no he came in and made my heart his home because I was the day that I was a lost sinner and I couldn't make it any other way except when I said yes Jesus I need you and you are my hope and I want to celebrate life you living within me that old hymn he walks with me And he talks with me. Boy, and and I think about Hebrews 13 as he says, as he walks and he talks, he says this. He says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. This Chinese Christian came to know the Lord in a glorious way, was saved. He was given his testimony one day. And he said these words, and I thought were profound. He said, I knocked on the door of Buddha, and all I heard was an echo. There was no answer. He said, then I knocked on the door of Muhammad. It said, there was only an echo. There was no answer. He said, after trying those two, he said, I knocked on the door of Confucius. I knocked, and there was no answer. All I heard was an echo. But he said, there was a day when I knocked on the door of Jesus Christ and Jesus heard me and he opened up his life, his door for me. And he says, I've never been the same because Jesus saved my soul. It's a simple gospel. And that's what God wants us all here to receive this morning. Many already have received him as Lord and Savior, but there are some that haven't here. And that's why we're we're here as we celebrate because we're celebrating life. We want to celebrate life in you as God will lead and move in your life. You ask me today how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. He lives within my heart. Easter is about finding hope. Easter is It's about celebrating life. And finally this morning, Easter is about experiencing restoration. Restoration. I know I'm not supposed to say this. They said in my preaching classes that you're not supposed to do what I'm getting ready to do. But out of the three points, the one that rocks my world more than any is that Easter is about experiencing restoration. To me, it's the most important part we can look at right now. 
Yes, he brings hope. We celebrate finding hope. Yes, we celebrate life because of the new life that he's given. But that's all so wonderful and restoration would not even be possible without it. But God has us here today and he wants to restore lives back to him. Can, will you notice just a little detail? And it's a little detail, but it's a huge detail. And it's absolutely amazing to me. Mark chapter 16 verse 7 says this. It says, but go and tell his disciples and Peter. Go and tell his disciples and Peter. Can I tell you, Peter had drifted. Peter had drifted. This may be for the, you the first time you've been here. It may be the second time you've been here. You may not have ever been here before. You may not go to church anywhere. Now, I'm not here to talk about that. I don't understand and I don't know why and how that can happen. But I know many times they come a few times and, and, and then they don't feel comfortable coming again. I want to tell you, Paul, Peter had drifted. Peter had drifted. This today is a word that he has for me and for you. One that will remind us that God loves us. I don't, if this is your first Sunday ever to be in church, can I tell you God loves you as much as he loves me or anybody that has all the Sunday school certificates and all the perfect attendance in worship? Can I tell you he loves you just as much as he loves anyone? Amen. He loves you and he went to the cross for you and he died for you and he wants you to respond to what he has done for you. See, Peter didn't plan, he didn't set to, mess up his life. He didn't plan to do what he did. He didn't say, Lord, I'm going to deny you. Just keep in mind, Lord, I'm going to walk with you, but there's going to come a time when I'm going to deny you. And then, Lord, you're going to see that I'm going to abandon you. And, and I'm going to abandon you in the time of your greatest need, Lord. I'm going to just turn my back on you. No. He never, never dreamed he would deny the Lord three times. Even Peter himself said, Lord, if the rest of this crowd denies you, you can count on me. I will never do such a thing. I will never deny you. I will walk with you. I will be there with you. He said, Lord, I'll even die for you. I'll die for you. You don't die for me. I will die for you. And you know what I believe? I truly believe that was the heart of Peter. I believe when he said those things that he meant it with everything in him. He believed that. He trusted that. Just like some here today. That maybe in the past you made a decision. And it was a bad decision that's, that's not where you know you should be spiritually in your walk and relationship. But God did not give up on Peter. Jesus just wants you to come home. And I'm not talking about to West Acres. He wants you to just come home. See, that's the heart cry that God wants me to share before you here this morning more than anything. That what He's done, the reason He did, He wants you to come home. Whether you're young, whether you're in the middle age, or whether you're older, no matter who or where you are or where you've been or what you're doing, He wants you to come home. He says here, He says, tell Peter. Tell Peter, this is so significant. These ladies here are so excited. So excited. Let's go and tell the disciples. Let's go and tell them. Let's go tell the disciples. I can't wait. Let's go tell them what's going on. Now, now it's not like it is when we come to church. Okay, we got to go. Hopefully nobody's sitting in my seat. Hopefully the song service is going to be shorter and the preaching's not going to be nearly as long. I hope I don't see that one lady. She always, always gets under my nerves. <laughs> it's not like when we come to church. They've heard the good news just like we have. They can't wait to get back and tell the disciples and to tell Peter. Matter of fact, they're kicking up dust. I can see them running now and I can see the dust in the way everywhere going because they're running so quickly. They're running all the way home. They're saying along the way, He's alive. He's alive. He lives today. 
we just saw an angel. And there's an empty tomb. Listen to me, Jesus is not there, they say. He's going to meet you in Galilee. He's going to meet you there. And here, get the picture in this room where the disciples are, scared, frightened. Peter, I picture, is in the very back of the room. Probably has his head down. Probably is really not wanting to talk to anyone, see anyone, have any kind of conversation. Because Peter, just a few days prior, had denied the Lord three times. And all of a sudden, they say this. Peter, he told us to go and tell everyone. But Peter, he mentioned you by name. He mentioned you by name, Peter. He he called you by name. And Jesus was saying to Peter here, and he says it to someone here today, Peter, I'm not going to focus on your sin. But Peter, I'm going to focus on your repentance of sin. I'm going to focus on reminding you that I love you and you're still mine. But now it's a time to repent. It's a time to repent of your sin. Even though you abandoned me, Peter, I will never abandon you. So Easter Sunday is a time to say, Lord, renew in me a new spirit or renew in me a new beginning, a new day. I've drifted, but I want to come back and I want to be in the center of your will. I want my life to be connected with you. Dear church, please hear that this morning. Please understand, it doesn't matter how many times you've been here. It just matters that you hear the love that God has for you and He desires this morning for Him to intervene and to take over your thought process and to remove an old hardened heart and give you a brand new one that will change you forever. At the end of World War I, there was a scene that played out all over the country. All over the country. One that is remembered to this day and one will continue to be remembered in the days to come. There was no Facebook. There was no internet. There was no Twitter, Instagram, or any of those things. None of that during World War I. Your son would leave and go to war. And you might not see him for four or five years. And not only would you may not see him for four or five years, you may not even know if he's dead or alive. At the end of the war, telegrams would start going out to all the families, to the homes, that we're beginning to arrive home. We're beginning to come home. You may hear something like this. This is Bob. I'm coming home at such and such a day. I'll see you, Mom. I'll see you, Dad. As they would travel during that day, they didn't have airplanes to get them back and all of the different things. Many, many, many cases. They would eventually have to get on a train. and They would go to a train station and they would wait to be picked up. One day, a dad left his house to go pick up his son. He went to the train station. As you can imagine, whenever he saw him, he was reunited with his son. He drove him home. His sister and his mother were eagerly waiting on that front porch, waiting to see their son. After they hugged him and after they greeted one another, they went inside the house They sat down in the living room, and as they sat there, the dad and the mom and the daughter, sister, got up and went in the kitchen. The son, who's just arrived back from the war, he's sitting there for quite some time, and he's wondering what's going on. Why has mom and dad and my sister left me just sitting here? I haven't seen my family in years, and now they're not even with me. He said later that his dad and mom and sister came back in. He knew there was something wrong, and he looked at them. He said, what's wrong with you all? Why, why with me being gone for such a long time, why did you leave me so long? What's wrong? 
They came and gathered around their son and brother. They stood around him and the dad said these words, Son, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to tell you the way it is. We're just trying to get used to you. Because you're not the way today that you were when you left years ago. You're not the same. You're not the same, so we're trying to get used to you. And the son said, Dad, are you talking about the fact that I don't have all my body parts? Are you talking, Dad, about that I have one arm less than when I left? Are you talking, Dad, about one leg that I have less less than whenever I left you? He said, Dad, while I was there, I was blown up by a German shell. And he told him, everybody sit down. The son said, everybody sit down. I have a story that I must tell you. A true story. I want you to sit and I want you to listen to me. He said, I was cut down, yes, by that German shell. I was lying there between the trenches in a place called no man's land. And while I was there in that trench at a place called no man's land, he said, rain was falling on my face and blood was oozing out of my wounds and I was waiting for the enemy to come and strangle out of me what little life that remained in me. And he said, all of a sudden, I saw a man walking across the battlefield. I could see him from a distance, but I noticed that his garment that he had on, it was pure and as white and fresh as snow. He said, and all of a sudden, he was beside me. And he was looking down at my face. And he even raised his hands up. And when he raised his hands up, I could see scars. And I could see wounds. They had been wounded, it looked like, by nails. And he said to me, I am the shepherd who is out looking for lost sheep. He said, I am the king of kings and the Lord of all battlefields. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life and I will save anyone who will believe in me. And I'm knocking at the door of your heart. And if you will open your door, I will come in. And the son looked at his dad and family. And he said, Dad... I let him in. The dad looked at him and said, Son, but what good is that? What good is that? You're back here with one leg. You're back here with one arm. What's such a big deal about that? I don't understand that. And he said to his dad and to his family, he said, my soul has been saved. And one of these days, one of these days, one of these days, I'm going to have two legs. One of these days, I'm going to have two arms. And above all of that, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because he knocked at my door and I opened that door. He came in to live within me. And church, listen to this. Death is dead. Death is dead. Satan and sin have been conquered and Christians will never die and Jesus is coming again and it's all because the grave could not hold Him. He is alive forevermore. Jesus is alive. That's worth celebrating here today. That's worth singing praises to the Savior. That's worth saying it doesn't matter where I've been, but I know who He is and where He can take me today and lead me tomorrow. This morning, church, this could be the last Easter that any of us experience here at West Acres or any place else. And that's why we gather today that we will leave here knowing Christ in our hearts and our lives. That we will know Him. We will know Him that we're going to be with Him. What difference did it make? He has been born again. He's a child of the king. He's going to rule and reign with the Lord. Whether he has one leg, five legs, or 26 arms, he's with Jesus. He's going to be with him forever and ever and ever again. This morning, please, 
Listen to me. The message has gone forth. He is our hope. We are to celebrate life. And we today are to experience restoration. Restoration, it can happen this morning. Somebody's here for the first Sunday. Somebody doesn't come to church very often. God wanted to give you this message to say, I love you, I care for you, but I want all of you. That doesn't mean you have to come to church every day, every Sunday. But it means that you trust me, love me, and live for me. Would you stand with me this morning? In the balcony and down here on this main floor, just stand with me. And I want you to bow your heads just for a moment. I want you to just bow your head. And I want you to ask the Lord right now, Lord, what do you desire for me to do? How, how do you want me to respond to the words that you place before me? How can I leave here today different than what I was whenever I came in? Whatever that may be, I want you to speak to me now, Lord. Would you do that? Would you ask him to speak to you? Would you ask him to encourage you here today? Every head bowed, and I'm going to ask you just to pray. But as you're praying, I cannot leave here today without making sure that everyone under the sound of my voice, and I have no power to save anyone. Only thing I can do is what God has given me the ability to do, and he's given it to you as well as a believer, and that is to plant seeds. That's what I want to do here today, and I want God to bring the increase. I want him to bring the increase here this morning. But if you're here today and you have never accepted the Lord, or maybe you're here today and you have accepted the Lord, but you've kind of drifted like Peter did, and you want to come and respond and just simply say, I want to get my life in the center of God's will, and I want it to begin on this new day, this new beginning, this Easter Sunday morning. I want to get it right with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning, you're here this morning and you desire to accept Christ, or if you've already accepted Him, but you want to recommit and rededicate yourself to Him this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something a little differently this morning for our folks. I'm going to ask you to come and I'm going to ask you to stand here at this altar. And I want you to come and just stand here and I want, you to, I want to talk to you just for a moment. So if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I want to ask you to do that. But I want to pray here just for a moment. Father, right now,